morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name is Dave Everett, and we're going to be starting a brand new series uh, this morning entitled Established in Righteousness. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Just so you know, all of our teachings are archived on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org, as well as our YouTube channel, the Lighthouse Discipleship Center. And we also want to say thank you to those who have uh, sponsored us and supported us with their tithes and offerings. In case you're wondering how to do so, you can simply go to our website at lighthouseception.org, go to the give page, and all the instructions are there. All right. So, uh, like I said, we're going to be starting a brand new series talking about being established in righteousness. Now, righteousness, anyone who knows me, <coughs> excuse me, is my number one teaching. It's the number one teaching that we started this church on, and it's the number one teaching that I teach on periodically. It's been a little while, so I thought it was time that I teach on this again. Uh, when we, you know, let me give you a little back history. When uh, between two two thousand nine and two thousand thirteen, in that window, and then even to two thousand sixteen, when we when Sherry and I went back to Bible College at Carrick Bible College. Um, but in 2009, 2013, God gave me a revelation of righteousness that I didn't know before. And uh, there was a lot, going, a lot not going on in our lives at that time. But uh, um, anyway, God gave me a revelation on it. And uh, at that time, I was not in ministry. And I said, Lord, if you can help me get back in ministry, I will uh, preach on this. And everything I preach on will be built on it. Everything I teach in this church, every message I've taught, has been, has, has been taught with this teaching being the foundation. Okay, this is the primary teaching that I teach. I've taught on it many times, and I'm going to teach on it again over the next few weeks. Okay, and so, uh, you know, <coughs> this teaching set me free from a lot of religion. This teaching set me free from a lot of wrong teaching and wrong believing that I had. This teaching set me free from some of my, my own addictions that I was, had going on in my life at the time. And actually had going on for a few, uh, few years, and too long. Uh, this teaching has just been very foundational to everything that we teach. And so periodically I'm going to come back and I'm going to reteach it again. Uh, because everything I teach is based on this. And when we started this church about 10 years ago, I, I, I spent almost a whole year teaching on this subject. I finally consolidated that down to about five to six, five to seven lessons, okay, depending on how long we go, but uh, it's just very foundational. And so I want to take the time and go as slow as needed, and I want to take the time and go as, you know, as fast as needed to get through it all. But this teaching is very foundational, okay, so everything I teach has this in it's, inter it's intertwined into everything that I teach. Um, I'm thinking, so we'll, we'll expand on what I just said uh, over the next few weeks uh, as we talk about this being so foundational. But in this first week, I, so each lesson uh, has kind of a, a sub-lesson or subtitle to it. And so the, the main message we're talking about is being established in righteousness. This first sub-lesson is entitled Being Established in the Unity of Faith. Excuse me. Now, this first sub lesson is kind of an overview of all of the lessons that we're going to be teaching on. Some of the things I'm going to teach this morning on, we will go back and we will have a whole lesson on just that topic and that subject. Okay. This first lesson is also the longest of the five or seven lessons. So, this one may take two weeks just to get through it, just depending on how, how we do. Okay. And so, anyway, we're, we're talking about righteousness in this particular segment of it, the very, very introductory of it, as we get started, um, the, the prelude to where we're going to, that it's, it's titled, Being Established in the Unity of the Faith. But before I can even talk about being established in the unity of the faith, I need to say one main top thing before I even get going there. That there's really one message that we preach. There's really one message that we should be preaching. 
And there's really one message that we should be believing and and proclaiming to the church and the unchurch, to the believers and unbelievers. In other words, for us to be unified, we need to be make sure that we're preaching one message. And this message of righteousness is foundational. But what I'm going to prelude here, what I'm going to introduce, what we're going to be talking about, is that there's one message, that, and I can preach it from the Old Testament, I can preach it from the New Testament, I can preach it from both tes Testaments, and I will preach it from both Testaments in this teaching, in this series, on righteousness. The word righteousness is used... And it's used in a couple of different ways. Justification is another way that it's used. But the term, the, the, the word, is in the Greek and the Hebrew, the Old and New Testament, and it's used over 500 times. Okay? And when you study the word out, and we'll get into a little more detail on some of that later, but it's a noun, it's not a verb. Okay? And that concept revolutionized my life. It set me free from some addictions, and it set me free from religion, it set me free. I mean, I, when I say it set me free from religion, I used to be, I've been in ministry for a while, but I took all my preaching notes when I got a revelation of righteousness. And I took all my preaching notes that I preached before. I took all my cassette tapes, and those, some of you might not know what those are, but back we used to record messages in our churches on cassette tapes. I took all the messages that I preached that were recorded, and I threw everything away. And I said, I'm preaching the wrong message because I was believing the wrong message because I didn't understand righteousness. But when I understood righteousness, everything came into alignment. And I said, Lord, if you give me back to ministry, just I'll preach on. So, getting back to what I was just saying a minute ago. There's one message that we need to be preaching. And there's one main message that we will be preaching in this church, in this ministry. If I don't preach this one message, I'm done. There's no ministry. There's no purpose of being here as far as us pastoring and preaching and teaching the word of God. We get this message wrong, everything else we teach is wrong. Okay? That's a pretty bold statement, but I stand by it. Okay? And so, let me introduce, let me let's get started. The first passage of scripture we're going to go to this morning, and I, don't, I have one main, I have several main scriptures in this, in this series. Okay? Um, some of those will come a little bit further down the pipeline as part of my main message, my main verses. But to get started this morning, <coughs> excuse me, so we're going to launch this off in the Old Testament from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Paul quotes this in also in Romans. Okay, and we'll get to that even later. But Isaiah 52, beginning of verse 7, is how we're going to open it up. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. What's good news? The gospel. Who proclaims peace. <coughs> Excuse me. Who brings glad tidings of good things. Who proclaims salvation. And who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now we're going to dissect this verse a little bit more and a little bit later. And we'll be doing it throughout this series and throughout this lesson today. But before we go deep into even this verse, let me just prelude this by saying there is one message that brings good news. There is one message that proclaims peace. There is one message that brings glad tidings of good things. There is one message that proclaims salvation. Salvation, by definition, right now we're reading from the Hebrew, it means wholeness, healing, prosperity, deliverance. It also means forgiveness. Some people don't like that definition, or I think we don't get your vote. It's based on the definition of the word, and that definition is not based on your vote or my vote. And there's only one message that says to Zion, his church, his bride, his people, your God reigns. This message reigns. God reigns. There's one message that proclaims salvation and tells the church, his bride, his people, your God reigns. And that's the message we preach, and that's the message we're teaching this morning. 
Let's go, let's move forward. We'll come back to this verse a little bit later. But I, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, and I believe this verse is a, is a thesis of the book of Romans, where I am not ashamed of the what? Gospel of Christ. And there's a colon there. I'm reading from the King James. There's a colon. What's the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is the power of God. If not, it's the power of God, and I love the King James, unto salvation. <coughs> this gospel that proclaims peace, that proclaims salvation, that says desire your God reigns. This gospel is, not can be, not should be. <coughs> it's not good advice, it's good news. It's good, it's something that, news is not something that will happen. News is something that already took happen, that has happened. Okay? In this gospel, of Christ, it's not just any gospel, but it's a gospel of Christ. This gospel is the power of God. It is the dunamis power of God to do what? To save. Now we're in the Greek. And the Greek definition of the word salvation is holiness, healing, prosperity, deliverance, forgiveness is part of the definition of the word. And it's not based on your boat or my boat. But that's the definition of the word. And the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And the salvation is available to everyone that believes. Everyone means nobody is excluded. And to everyone that, I love this in the King James, that believeth. Because it's not just believing, but the if on the end of the word means to believe and continue to believe. For the just shall live by faith. We're not just saved by faith in his grace. We live by faith. Okay? And we'll, we'll expand on that later. So the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Why was it to the Jews first? Because it was offered to them first. Okay? That's how God, God gave it to them. God presented it to them. We'll read later in our study, but the same gospel was preached unto them as well as to us. Quoting from Hebrews chapter 4. The gospel was preached to the Jews. And if we've also heard the same gospel here in the New Testament. And what therein, what therein what? What are we talking about? The gospel. Because everything here is talking about the gospel. See the colon? <coughs> therein what? Therein the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. <coughs> I'll be expounding on this later in our study, a lot more detail. But the gospel, if it's preached correctly, will always reveal the righteousness of God. From, and it's revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I just talked about that. So there's one message that we're supposed to preach. This message proclaims peace. When God tried to get the good thing, it's good news. It proclaims salvation. It says to Zion, your God reigns. And this gospel, this one message, is the power of God. It is. It's not a rubber, it's not a mirror, it's not a reflection of, it's not a prototype, it's not a, an allegory. It is. The power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. For therein, for therein, this gospel, this one message that we preach, is the righteous God revealed from faith to faith. For we the for we the just, we the righteous, because the word just and the word righteous are the exact same word. We the righteous, we the just live 
by our lives. In him we live and we move and we have our being. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So, the gospel message is the power of God. It reveals the righteousness of God. It reveals the righteousness of God from faith to faith in his gospel. See, our faith is in the gospel. And that's where the power of God is being also revealed. Okay. And we'll discuss this a lot more later on in our second lesson. We'll go into a lot more detail with this verse. Let's go to another verse from Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For by one man's offense, he's talking about Adam and the fall in Genesis chapter 3. By one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Let's, let's pause there for a moment. All right, I'll just read the whole thing because you're going to read it without me. Death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So let's go back now. Let's go slow. By one man's offense, whose offense is that? That's Adam's. Through the fall. And because of Adam's offense, death reigned. From Adam to the cross, death reigned. Death reigned in many, many, many ways. It reigned through the law. And we'll look at, we'll see this a little bit later on. But the law is a ministry of death. It reigned through sin. The, and the wages for sin is death. To be carnally minded is death. The consequences, the wages for sin was death. The wage. We all earned a wage for sinning. And that's called death. And death reigned. It ruled. It conquered. It dictated. Death reigned. It reigned through sickness and diseases of all kinds. There are results and curses from the fall. From, from sin. And as much as death has reigned for centuries, for, for millenniums, from, again, Adam fall to the cross of Christ, death reigned. <coughs> And those who have not received, those who have not believed this gospel and the salvation that it brings, death is still reigning in those, in their lives, and in their consequences, and their actions. <coughs> but as much as that is true, and I don't think any of us can disagree that death has reigned in mankind since the fall. Most of you religious folks, you keep talking about sin all the time on Facebook. Repent, repent, repent. And there's a place for that, and I'm not trying to water that down. But unless you receive Jesus, the gift of righteousness, death will continue to reign. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so I need to hold that thought. But much more. Death reigned, yes. It's been rain, it did rain. And in many people it's still raining because they haven't received Jesus. But much more, those who receive, you gotta receive it. It's not mandated on you. You have to receive it. It's a gift. And you can say thank you and receive it, or you can say no thank you and reject it. Those who receive the abundance of grace, it's great, you can't earn it. It's a gift. And of the gift of righteousness will reign in this life through the one Jesus Christ. Okay? So, there's one message. There's one message that proclaims good news. But proclaims peace and salvation and declares our God's word. There's one message that's the power of God to salvation that reveals the righteousness of God. And there's one message that we need to receive so that we can reign in life. It's called the message of grace. It's called
called the, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness so that we can lead in life. <coughs> when we receive the revelation of the one message and trust in it, we are destined to reign in life. Due to the finished work of the cross, we are destined to receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness that enables us to reign. There's only one way that you can reign. There's only one way that you can receive peace. There's only one way that you can receive salvation. And that is through the gospel of Christ. <coughs> and the gospel of Christ reveals the righteousness of God. And there's only one message that we can receive in order to reign in life. And that is the gift of grace. And the gift of righteousness. Let's go to another verse in Corinthians. On the King James, Paul says, Now I beseech you then, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. And there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly good joined together, <coughs> excuse me, in the same mind, and in the same judgment. Okay. Excuse me. Let me repeat this cough. I will preach this message. So Paul, he's writing to the church, brethren. Okay? All Paul's letters, he's not writing to the world, he's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. He's writing to you and I, brethren. Sisters, don't get offended. If you want to, you can put sisters in there. Okay? Sisters, I'm not talking about a whale. I'm talking about the female. Okay? He says, but I love this. Because Paul says, I beseech you. Paul is beseeching us. He's beseeching us by the name that's above all names. That we all speak the same thing. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote more than two-thirds of the New Testament, beseeches us in the name that's above all names. Paul is using the strongest language he can use without cussing. Without using profanity. And he's beseeching us, the church, in the name of Jesus. The strongest language, the strongest authority, government of authority and power that he can use. That we all speak the same There's one message. There's one message. That we how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings us good news. Who proclaims peace. Who proclaims salvation. And the care and care of Zion. Here's that means. There's one message that is the power of God is in salvation. To everyone who believes. Because therein is the righteousness of God revealed. There's one message where we can reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. As much as death has reigned in life, much more those who receive this message and this gift will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Paul preached one. He goes on to say in the same chapter, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, and there's something wrong with that, but that wasn't his main message. That was not the one message. That was not his ministry is all about. That was some of the fruit of his ministry. And Paul, Christ is not saying to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes it. There in the gospel is the right of God revealed. Now with wisdom of words, that's the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. But the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, 
but unto us which are saved. The gospel is the power of God. Paul, and I'm, I, I'm going to echo what Paul said because I know what God's called me to do. And God, and God called me to marry people and bury people, even though we might do that from time to time. God didn't call me to do this or do that. God called me to preach the gospel. I'm not opposed to doing other things at times, as long as this is what God has called us or called God's called you to do. But no matter what all that stuff is, there's one main thing that God has called me to do, God has called us to do, and we're all supposed to be preaching the same, speaking the same thing, and that is to preach the gospel of Christ. And I make this a strong point because Paul besieges us in the strongest way he could in the name of Jesus Christ that we all speak this same thing, that we all preach this gospel. It's good news. And this gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. Okay? Paul preached the gospel, the message of the cross. And Paul's desire is that the cross of Christ would have an effect in our life. Because it's not about words of wisdom that where that's the cross of Christ should be in our life. God, Paul wants the word of God, the gospel of Christ, to have effect in your life. Okay? See, salvation is not a one-time acceptance to get our ticket punch to heaven and avoid hell. Do we want people to avoid hell? Yes. Do we want people to go to heaven? Yes. And it's worth preaching and it's worth teaching. But that is not the main goal. The main goal we're going to get into it, is having a relationship with God. If all you do is go to heaven and avoid hell, but you don't even have a relationship with God, you're missing the main point. Guess one of the biggest benefits of, of being saved is going to heaven and avoiding hell. I'm not eliminating that. But I will never make that the main message. The main message is having a right relationship with God. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is a, benef is a beneficiary of that relationship. I don't want to be in that one way. One, one Depart from me. I never knew you. You're going to heaven, but does he know you? Do you know him? Are you righteous? Are you having a right relationship with God? That's what righteousness is, and we'll get into that. I know I'm getting a little, my preaching's a little ahead of the game here. Okay? But it's not just getting fire insurance, avoiding hell. It's not just getting your ticket punched to go to heaven. It's about having a dynamic relationship with God. And there's many benefits that come out of that. And one of those main benefits is that you get to go to heaven and avoid hell. But one of the main benefits of heaven is that you get to be with God face to face. And the worst, the worst thing about hell is God is not there. And nobody on this earth has ever been in a God forsaken place. Because the earth is filled with his glory. You might reject him. You might be in a place that's very demonic and evil and, the, and, and the, full of witchcraft and, 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 and Satan. But God is still there. He might not be acknowledged. He not might not be received. But there is no place on this planet that the earth is not filled with his glory. But hell is different. His presence is not there. It can't be acknowledged there. Because it doesn't exist. Remember, the just lives by his faith. 
And Paul preached a message that we would preach. He told, he's preaching to the church. He's exhorting the church. He's beseeching the church in the name of Jesus that we all speak the same message because it's the foundation. You get the foundation? Everything, everything, see, if you don't have the foundation right, everything you preach on top of it is wrong. Or it's out of bounds. It's misconstrued. We have to keep the main thing the main thing. Do I want people to repent? Yes. But I want people to turn to Jesus. And by turning to Jesus, they're turning from sin. It's not turning from sin and no relationship with Jesus. That's not repentance. That's behavior modification. We're not about behavior modification. Behavior modification is part of the fruit but it's not the root. I don't want people just to turn from sin. I want them to turn to Jesus and have a relationship with him. That's righteousness. Righteousness is not just not sinning. If you, you can live a very pious life and not live in sin and not participate in sin, not be sinning as far as we know, you're not committing murder. You're not committing adultery, you're not lying, you're not stealing, you're not cheating. But anything that's not a faith is sin. And if you don't have a relationship with God, even if you're not committing what we know is a sin, see, there's not just sins of commission, there's also sins of omission. I might have got that backwards. But there's not just things that we are doing that we shouldn't do. Some of us are not doing the things that we should do. And anything that's not based on faith is not birth out of faith. It's sin. Faith meaning that you're trusting God. It takes faith to live right. To just live by His faith. If you're living pious and godly without a relationship with God, you have the nerve to say that you're living holy based on what you did. That's pride. That's pride to the highest core. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That you're saying the reason you are living holy is because of you. That's wicked. The only reason I'm living a godly life is because of Jesus. Jesus made me holy. Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, is temperance. It's not the fruit of the flesh. And the only reason I'm living a godly life is because of Jesus, not me. Yes, I have to yield to that. Yes, I cooperate. But He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is my healer. He is my Savior. He's the one that sanctified me, not me. He gets all the glory, not me. And in that, not just am I living a holy life, I'm living a relationship with God. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of God. I live by the faith of God. I live by the faith of God. I live by the faith of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 right, I, I get a lot of help of myself over a lot of that I just said. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead. See, Paul said this in Thessalonians. Night and day, he said he was praying exclusively that we may see your face to face. He, Paul wanted to see the church in Thessalonica. He was praying day and night exceeding that he could see them face to face. That why? Because he wanted to perfect what is lacking in their faith. Now some people will read something like that and say, that was harsh. Paul wasn't being harsh. Some people would, would think that's a rebuke. Some people would get offended by something. If, if I told you I'm, I want to come to your church so I can perfect what is lacking your faith, some of you would be offended. We 
What do you mean I don't have faith? I didn't say he didn't have faith. But, folks, none of us is bad in a thousand. None of us are, is living this life of faith on all cylinders. If we did, we would see a lot of different results. We would see people getting healed, delivered, set free. We'd be seeing miracles. We'd see people being raised from the dead. Left and right. But none of us have been doing it perfectly. And we all need someone like Paul to speak into our life who is inspired and anointed by the Holy Spirit to perfect that which is lacking in our faith. This is not a condemning rebuke. But this is reproof. For all scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for doctrine, for training in righteousness, so the man of God can be fully equipped for every good work. And the King James says, be perfected for every good work. All scripture is profitable for reproof, for training, for instruction in righteousness. What I just quoted from you, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We'll get there. It's in my notes today if we get that far. But we all need to be reproved at times. That's a good thing. Okay? This is a reproof to get to get the just to live by their faith. We all need perfection, what's lacking in our faith. Some more than others, some less than others. The fact that you are offended by that tells me you need a lot of perfection. Okay? Something's wrong. Something's majorly wrong if you're offended by that. I want godly people who are preaching the truth. Not religion. I won't listen to religion. That's a bunch of caca. But I want to... But those who are preaching the truth, those who are going to point me to Jesus, I need those people in my life to preach the truth and perfect that which is lacking in my faith. That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. See, it's like a sport. Baseball or football or gymnastics or anything you might see in the Olympics. None of those athletes that you see winning a gold medal Silver medal or bronze medal, or even just being there in the in the in the in the Olympics, they all have a good coach, and a good coach is perfecting what is lacking in their ability to perform that sport. They're going to coach them hard. They're going to exercise. They're going to lift weights. They're going to run and they're going to run and they're going to run. They're going to run. They're going to run in their sleep. They're going to perfect what is lacking in their physical ability to perform that sport. And they're going to drive them to excellence. That's not being condemning. That's helping them. And a good coach will bring a lot of reproof. It's part of coaching. It's part of mentoring. It's part of pastoring. It's part of uh, being a disciple. Of Christ. So, see, what are you trusting in? That's what faith is. To perfect, to perfect what is lacking in your faith. See, faith has everything to do with what are you trusting in? What are you relying on? What are you resting in? You know, there have been people who have come to me for prayer. And we love praying for people. And praying for people, we should pray for one another. Okay? That's a good thing. But sometimes when people come to me in prayer, I guess in the meantime I'll ask, what are we praying for? But sometimes in the dialogue I'll ask them, you, you know, you just get someone to talk for a few minutes about what they're going through. It doesn't, even, it doesn't have to take a long time. But you can, you can, you can, when you, when you, when people are talking, 
and they're sharing their prayer requests, I'm list also listening, not just what they are saying, but also what they're not saying. For example, here, let me just take this off the screen for a minute. For example, I might go to a pastor, a friend, and I might theologically have all the right answers. I know I shouldn't be wrestling with this, but right now I'm just wrestling. I know God's my answer. I know he's provided it through the cross. But right now I'm just struggling getting a breakthrough. And I, I'll go on and on how I know God is my source. He's my savior. He's my healer. He's my provider. Well, it depends on what I'm praying for. But I'm wrestling. I need prayer. I need agreement. But there's some people, they'll tell me all day long how what their prayer request is, but they'll never tell me anything about their faith in Jesus. Who has the answer for the prayer requests? They need someone to come along, not just to pray with them in agreement, but they also need someone to come back by and perfect what is lacking in their faith. Because in their, in their struggle and seeing an answer, Nowhere in the dialogue, and some people will share, they'll go along at length and lo go over and over, long, long, long time, talk what the prayer request is, but in that prayer request, I've never heard faith. That Jesus is the answer. He's the healer. He's the provider, whatever the request might be. And I'm not hearing faith. And yes, I want to pray with them and pray for them, but I also going to perfect what's lacking their faith. <coughs> as much as I'm going to be praying for them, I want to put, I want them to get their eyes on Jesus and stop focusing on the storm, stop, stop magnifying the problem, and start magnifying the answer, which is Jesus, which is faith in God. And that's perfecting what's lacking their faith. My, the answer is not me. The answer is not even my prayer. The answer is who I'm praying to. And I want them to not, I'm not only agreeing with them in prayer and praying for them, I also am trying to get their faith on God. Put faith in His Word. My God shall supply my needs according to His riches. I'm here to, going back to our first verse, I'm here to. Proclaim peace to the situation. I'm here to bring glad tidings and good things. I'm here to proclaim salvation, healing, prosperity, deliverance, wholeness. And I'm here to declare to them, Zion, this thing doesn't reign. Your God reigns. That's perfecting what is lacking in your faith. Because even in our prayers, even in our ministry to one, one another, we are preaching one message. <coughs> no matter what the problem is, no matter what the prayer request is, financial, physical, relational, um, sin, meaning addiction, we, are all, we need to get back in alignment to why don't we trust in it? Because it just was by his faith. <coughs> and if our faith is out of alignment, then we need to get our faith back in alignment. And when we do, boom, the answer will be there. And we'll spend more time on what I just said a little bit later. But, but this will take you back on it. It says here in the Philemon that the communication by faith may be a factual may become effectual. Well, how? By acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Well, how, the communication of faith. How does your, the faith that you're communicating, and if you really want to get technical, we'll, we'll unpack it a more later. The, 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 word, the Greek word for this word communication is koinia. Fellowship. The fellowship of your faith becomes effective. See, that's why a lot of Christians are frustrated. 
And that's why some Christians have left the faith. Because they prayed, they ministered, they did this, but they weren't seeing, their prayers weren't working. It wasn't working. It wasn't effective. There's only one way <coughs> for your faith to be effective. You need to acknowledge every good thing which you do to you, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, you just to know what, what good things are in you. The healing that you're praying for is already in you. That provision that you need, it's already in you. That answer that you're praying for, it's already in you in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Christ Jesus is already in you. And he has all the answers. See, by his stripes, you were healed. Jesus is not going to the cross again. He died on the cross once and for all. And the healing that you need is already in his stripes. And he's in you. He's your advocate to enforce your healing. To enforce your provision. He became poor that you may become rich and have need of nothing. I'm paraphrasing some verses from Corinthians, and we'll get into that later. Everything you need, you already got. It's in you. You need to acknowledge it. And that faith becomes effective. It turns on. Do you know how many little devices? I mean, I have a little click in my hand. But this device is not going to work until all the components that are connected with this device are connected. It needs batteries. It has a little thingy to bob that I plug into the, the computer. But the computer itself needs to be connected to electricity or battery. But if everything's turned on, including the TV, this thing works. This thing becomes effective. And I can click things. I can blacken it out. I can do other, do other things with this clicker. It becomes effectual. Why? Because everything's working. All the components are acknowledging what they're, what they're supposed to be doing. But if I just remove one of those elements, take a battery out, unplug it from the device, turn the computer off, turn the TV off, and those are the basics. This thing's not going to work. It's not going to be effectual. Faith works when you turn it on. How do you turn it on? You acknowledge every good thing which is in you. What does this have to do with righteousness? Let's go back. What does this have to do with righteousness? For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And it's revealed from faith to faith. For the just shall live by his faith. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And it reveals it from faith to faith. That's what the gospel is doing. So what we, the just, the righteous, can live by his faith. And we want our faith to work. Because that's how we live. We live by faith. And how do we do that? We acknowledge every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. Because that's what the gospel is revealing. So if, if the gospel is revealing something... But we're acknowledging something totally different than we are not acknowledging what the gospel is acknowledging. We're not in alignment with the gospel. The gospel is revealing the righteousness of God, faith to faith, but we're acknowledging something that's in disalignment with that. It's not going to work. 
But if the gospel is revealing the righteousness of God from faith to faith, and we begin to acknowledge what the gospel is revealing, we are in alignment with the gospel, we are in alignment with what it's revealing, we're acknowledging it, it will work. Because the gospel is the power of God. And if we're not connected to what the gospel is revealing, it's not going to work. But if we are, it's the power of God. Unto salvation, unto healing, unto wholeness, unto prosperity, unto deliverance, whatever we need, and unto salvation. It works. And it will work for everybody, every time. This is awesome. Let's go to another verse. In Hebrews. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. Let's pause here for a moment. Okay, I know you're going to read ahead. So far he said in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the book of Hebrews, he says, God, through the ages, has been speaking to his people. By, in various ways, in various manners, he has spoken to our forefathers by the prophets. In other words, let me re-say it again. God, since the beginning, has been speaking to our forefathers in various ways and manners. God has always been speaking. He's been speaking to our forefathers. He's done it in many different ways. He's spoken to the prophets. He's spoken to a donkey called Balaam. It's donkey. He's spoken through many ways and many ways. He's spoken through dreams. He's spoken through visions. He's spoken to prophets. He's spoken to donkeys. He's spoken to all kinds of things. God has been speaking. God is never not speaking. God has been speaking at various times, in various ways. He has spoken in time past his body by the prophets. And has in these last days spoken to us by his son called Jesus Christ. And his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he has also made all the worlds. So God has been speaking, God has been speaking since the beginning. He has spoken in various ways, in various times, through the prophets. But he is now speaking through his son. And his son, who is his son? His son is the one he's appointed to be heir of all things. And the son has created the worlds. Okay? Who, is still talking about Jesus, being the brightness of the glory, the same son who he's speaking to, he has been speaking, who being the brightness of the glory and the express image of his person, he's seen, he's seen Jesus, he's seen the Father. He's express image of of his person, and he is upholding all things by the word of his power when he himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of his majesty and high. <coughs> so let's put this together real quick. God has always been speaking. Why am I saying this? Because I said there's one message. There's one message that proclaims peace. There's one message that proclaims salvation, declares to Zion, your God reigns. There's one message that the power of God is in salvation to everyone who believes. That reveals the righteous God from faith to faith, that we the just live by faith. There's one message that although death reign, has day reigned since the beginning through Adam, much more those who receive this message of grace and of righteousness will reign in life. There's one message that we need to acknowledge. There's one message. Let me go back. Huh? We, there's one message that we need to acknowledge that makes our, our faith effectual. There's one message that Paul beseeches in the name of all names that we all speak the same thing. There's one that God's been speaking. He's been speaking a message. In various times, in various ways, has not to the prophets. All the way from Moses, who was a prophet, 
all the way to Malachi, who was a prophet, has in these last days now spoken to us through Jesus. This Jesus, who's the heir of all things. He's the creator of the world. He's the express image of his person. And he's speaking to us through his son, who is upholding all things that he created. He's upholding all things by the word of his power. When he himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of God. So in other words, again, God has been speaking one message since the genesis of all things. How many of you know the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world? And God is now speaking through his son that same message. And Jesus is the expressed image of the Father. If you've heard him, you've heard the Father. And God is upholding all things. He's upholding all things. Everything that God's created. He's upholding by the power of his word. And not just any word. It's the word. What word is he upholding all things? He's upholding all things by one specific message, one specific word. When he purged our sins. <coughs> so in other words, you know, I used to tell my wife, I said, you know, if God, if Jesus didn't die for our sins, then we would just all turn to good. But my wife corrected me. He said, no. We wouldn't turn to good. Because he's he upholding all things by the word of his power. If God doesn't keep his word, and one specific word that he needs to keep is what he did on the cross. If that wasn't true, <coughs> if that wasn't, because it's what he did on the cross, purging our sins, that he's upholding all things. If God, if that word doesn't true, we wouldn't turn to good. We would just disintegrate. Not exist. Because everything God created, He upholds. I'm talking about the cosmos. I'm talking about the universe. I'm talking about the planet. I'm talking about the solar system. I'm talking about the waves and the ocean and the planet and all the minerals by we we created everything, including this device and this computer. I mean, this 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 TV, internet, electricity, everything else, this podium, everything that's been created, the iPad and everything that's being used to record this message, including this microphone, including the, the water. And the bottle that contains the water. And everything else. The table. Even though man might have manufactured it. God created all of those things for man to create things with. He upholds all things. By the power of his word when he purged our sins. And if this wasn't true. We wouldn't turn to good. We would just cease to exist. There's one message. And it's not just any message. It's the message of him purging our sins. Because it's the gospel of Christ. It's him purging our sins. That reveals this righteousness. Another verse. Another way of echoing what I just said. In Isaiah, God speaks and says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from the heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper for which I sent it. There's a twofold message here. God's word will never return to the void. His written word 
His spoken word will never return void. Are you following me? He goes, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth and it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish for what I, I please and it shall prosper for the thing which I said. But he's not just talking about the written word and even the spoken word. He's also talking about the living word. Jesus. Because the word is not the ink. The word is a person. His name is Jesus. And God sent Jesus that's where we celebrate Christmas. He sent Jesus to come to purge our sins. And Jesus, after he purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand. He returned to the Father. He, the Word, came and accomplished what he pleased and prospered for the thing for which he sent it, which is the cross to redeem you and I into a right relationship with God called righteousness. And he returned to the Father, sitting down on his majesty on high. We're going a lot deeper with this in, uh, in the weeks to come. Okay. This, everything I've shared so far this morning has been a prelude to everything we're going to get into. And a lot of what we shared this morning so far, I'm going to go deeper with some of these things. Many of these things. Okay? But there's one, one thing I've been trying to stress and bring across so far in this first lesson is that there's one message. And it's called the message of righteousness. That we need to be established. And that made sense so far. See, in the sub-message that's in this first lesson, we're not going to finish this week. I only have about two more minutes left, and that's fine. Because I want a lot of what I share so far to sink in as we go to next week's lesson. But this week and next week, the subheading for these two messages is to be established in the unity of the faith. We want to be established in righteousness, but we, in, in doing that, we need to be established in the unity of the faith. So let me start to go into this, but we're not going to finish this. Okay? And this is kind of part two of part one. Does that make sense? Okay? So as we talk about the unity of the faith, and we can't be unified if we don't preach the same message, we need to first of all define what unity is. Because there's some misconceptions of what even unity is. Okay? Now, I got this quote from Andrew Womack, and it's worth quoting, and so I'm going to say it. In defining unity, Andrew says, Love is the bond of perfection that holds us together. So stop right there just for a second. Love is the bond of perfection that holds us together. We got that? We are bonded together by doctrine. But we must have a shared foundation of doctrine to have unity. I want to read that again. Love is a bond of perfection that holds us together. And we are bounded together by doctrine. But we must have a shared foundation of doctrine to have true unity. So in other words, unity is not just coexisting. Unity is not tolerance of false or wrong doctrine. Unity must share a common foundation of righteousness and truth. Because righteousness and truth are the foundation of the strata. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Okay? It's good to love one another and get along with one another. But if we're going to talk about unity, we can't have true unity if we don't have the same foundation. If some of you, I love you. I don't want to fight you. I don't want to argue with you. 
I don't hate you. But if we're going to do something together, unified, we might disagree on some things, but there's some things that are non-negotiable as far as us having unity to walk together. That doesn't mean I can't, well, some people agree to disagree, and there's a separation. We're not fighting. But if we're going to be unified, if we're going to walk together, if we're going to do ministry together, there's some things that are not negotiable in order for us to have unity. Because if the foundation is different, if the core of who we are and what we believe is different, then it's going to have to be very hard to be unified in the faith. That makes sense. Okay? Based on that, based on what I've said to about one message, let's get into a little briefly here. I only have six minutes left. Talk about the unity of the faith. And I'm going to preface that by going to Paul's first prayer. He has four main prayers that he prays. But the first one he prays in Ephesians. And we'll come back here next week and we'll pick up here next week. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays. Now, there's just something about this. When Paul's praying, I love reading Paul's prayers. Because when if we read Paul's prayer and we study his prayers, one... You and I can learn how to pray. You and I can learn how to pray correctly. But I also hear something. Here's Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. And most of the foundational teaching that you and I have about Christianity came from Paul. So in many ways, he's our father in the faith. Indirectly. Through his writings. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay, But when I'm reading Paul's prayers, I'm hearing his heart. I'm hearing what he wants you and I to understand and comprehend. Because what Paul is praying for you and me, I want to grasp, I want to become established in, what Paul is praying out of his heart that you and I would comprehend. That tells me a lot. And what does Paul want? Well, let's read his prayer. He says, Who is a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of our precious possession to the praise of his glory? Therefore I also, after I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Because this is kind of prelude to his prayers. There's a colon right here. So now he's going to pray. Okay? This isn't his prayer yet. This is more a prelude to his prayer. Okay? Oops. Wrong button. He put, this is his prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches and the glory of his inheritance in the saints. There's a lot here, and we're not done with the prayer yet. But Paul wants us to have a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, in the knowledge of who? Jesus. Paul wants us to get a revelation of Jesus. Okay? Paul wants the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened. That we would know, we would know the hope of his calling. We would know the inheritance that we have in him. He wants us to, and, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Paul wants us to get a revelation. He wants us to understand, be enlightened. He wants us to know something. He wants to know the hope of our calling, the inheritance that we have in the saints. <coughs> the same greatness of his power. 
What power? The same power towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power when he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him. See, it's not just about the resurrection. It's not the ascension too. <coughs> and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. What's he doing there? Far above all principality. Whatever you're going through, whatever Satan's doing in your life, he is seated. He's the king of all kings. He is God on the throne. And I'll get into it later, but the foundation of that throne that he's sitting on is righteousness. And he seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every <coughs> excuse me, name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. Who fills all now? There's a lot here. I'm gonna come back next week, and we're gonna unpack this a little bit more. And I'm basically out of time. I don't have time really to read this and not give you a lot of commentary on this. As you can also, but let me just say this: Paul's been saying so far what we've learned. He's beseeching us in the name of all names that we all preach the same thing that we get a message, one main message. When we preach the gospel of Christ, that's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believeth. Therein is the righteous revealed. And this righteousness, this gift of righteousness, when we receive it, we can reign in life. He's come to perfect that was lacking of faith. He wants our faith, as he said, as he wrote Philemon, that it would become effectual as we acknowledge every good thing that's in him, Christ Jesus. Paul wrote that. Okay? And Paul wants us to be established in the unity of faith, and we're going to get there. We're only in Ephesians 1, and Ephesians 4 is where I get to the phrase, unity of the faith. Okay? But Paul it wants us to get something. He wants us to get a revelation, understand something. Okay? And that, that, that enlightenment has a lot to do with the hope of our calling, our inheritance, and the power of God that raised Christ from the dead. And not only raised him from the dead, <coughs> excuse me, but seated him at the right hand of God. And then he says he put all things under his feet. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the significance of the feet. And then our feet are also shod with the gospel of peace. And how beautiful are the feet of him, are the mountains of the feet of him who brings good news. Who proclaims peace. Who brings glad tidings of good things. Who proclaims salvation. And declares to Zion. Your God reigns. There's a lot here. I haven't totally unpacked everything yet. I Hopefully this is coming across like a fire hose. But it's just a preliminary to where we're going to get. Everything I'm trying to teach here in this series and we're just barely getting started. Everything I just shared so far is just a prelude of what we're going to get into. This has transformed my life. It's revolutionized my life. It set me free from sin. It set me free from religion. It set my, it's transformed our marriage. It's transformed our finances. It's transformed our health. Outside this asthma cough that I still need to get set free from, I haven't been sick since 2009. I don't get the cold or flu. And I rebuke this cough the same way I rebuke those things. Let's transform my life. I'm here preaching the gospel unto you. I'm here to preach Christ unto you. I'm here to preach him and preach Christ and him crucified. I wish I had more time today. I don't believe we'll come back next week. We got, you know, there's no rush. There's no race getting through this. But we're going to go through this little by little. I'm going to share the, the, the main teaching that we teach in this church. Everything that we teach is based on this premise. And I'm going to teach you the, the greatest revelation. Talk about revelation. I'm going to teach you the greatest revelation God's ever given me. 
And I'm not saying that because I'm lifting myself up. I just can't thank him enough for giving me this revelation to set my life free and set and give power in my life. And I just want to share with you what God has revealed to me because it's so revolutionary. And I will preach this message to until Jesus comes. And I'm going to preach it again here in this study as we're talking once again about being established in righteousness. God bless you guys. Have a great week and we will talk to you soon.